Science. In the year 1403, one of the most extraordinary innovations in Royal Battlefield Surgery began here, at Shrewsbury. Sixteen-year-old Prince Henry, the son of King Henry IV and heir to the throne, was leading the left flank of his father's army against a rebel force. Going into battle risked his life, his father's Lancastrian dynasty, and the stability of the entire kingdom. Prince Henry was a fine-looking lad, looked good in armour. He already had military experience behind him. He seems to have had leadership qualities. He would have known a lot of the people who were fighting with him on that day. He had the respect of his troops. But Prince Henry's heroic example here almost created a national crisis. As the troops he commanded advanced up the gentle slope to where the battlefield church now stands, they came under attack from the notorious Cheshire Longbowmen. Their lethal weapons were the machine guns of their day. Almost immediately, the heir to the throne was right in the middle of a storm of arrows. It was the crown's worst nightmare. Prince Henry was struck by an arrow in the face. Despite his appalling wound, the courageous prince fought on until victory was theirs. By the end of the day, the battle had been won. Hotspur, the enemy leader, lay dead. But the future of the country remained unsure. Prince Henry was still in mortal danger. Just like the fatal wound of Richard the Lionheart, the wooden shaft of the arrow was pulled out. But the arrow head was still wedged in his skull. After the battle, Prince Henry was taken to a safe haven. What happened next is one of the most remarkable medical stories of late medieval times. At first, Henry's royal surgeons had little idea of what to do, resorting to potions and charms. Then there arrived one of the finest surgeons of the age, John Bradmore. Henry, the son and heir of the illustrious king, had been struck in the face with an arrow beside the nose on the left side, and the head of the said arrow after the arrow shaft was extracted, remained in the backbone of the skull, six inches deep. Bradmore's description is that the arrow passed deep into the prince and wedged against the bone of the skull. Prince Henry was very lucky indeed. If the arrow had gone into the cranial cavity and had damaged his brain, or if it had crossed the midline, damaging the spinal cord and the major blood vessels around the base of the skull, then his death would have been inevitable and almost instantaneous. Henry might also have been saved by another piece of good fortune. At the time of the Battle of Shrewsbury, more and more people were wearing plate armour on the battlefield, and a function of plate armour is to create deflective surfaces. The arrowhead embedded in Henry's skull was a bodkin, a type of arrow specifically designed to defeat plate armour, but it can only do so if the angle of strike gets it at 90 degrees. For the most part, it would be glancing off. And I think that that is probably what happened to the arrow that went into Prince Henry, because something must have slowed it down. An arrow of this type, if it had come head on into him there, at full power, would probably have come out of the skull the other side. Henry would probably have his visor up so he could breathe, so he could command, deliver orders, be seen to be there in the midst of the battle. Forward! Arrows coming specifically into that area would be glancing off, and I think it was one of those arrows, a freak accident, that glanced off straight into his face. Although he escaped instant death by a matter of millimetres, Bradmore, his surgeon, knew that if the arrowhead wasn't removed quickly and cleanly, the wound would become infected just like Henry's ancestor, Richard the Lionheart. The arrow has entered his face here, and it would have passed through these very thin plates of bone that form the facial skeleton, and come to rest against the more solid bone of the base of the skull. Now, Bradmore has the difficult task of trying to remove this. He can't use the more conventional medieval approach towards arrow removal, which is to actually push it straight through and out the other side. Bradmore was faced with the task of exploring the wound 
and grasping the end of this bodkin and withdrawing it, conscious of the fact that there were a lot of vital structures within very close proximity to the bodkin. To save the prince's life, Bradmore set about designing a special metal tool. This remarkable document, written by Bradmore himself, describes exactly what he made. Historian Tig Lang has brought it to archaeological ironworker Hector Cole. Using traditional ironworking techniques, Hector is going to attempt to remake the tool. Now this is in Latin, so, so you will have to translate this for me because I don't understand the Latin. This was written by the surgeon, John Bradmore, who actually removed the arrow from the prince's skull. And this is his description, blow by blow, yes. of the wound as he found it and what he does in order to reach the arrowhead and extract the arrowhead. He says after other surgeons had failed to do so. The first thing he does is actually to open up the wound again yes. around where the shaft of the arrow had gone. To ensure the wound didn't close up and to help him find the arrowhead, Bradmore made small probes, which he called tents. First, I made tents of the pith of old elder, dried well and wrapped well in clean linen cloth. These tents were dipped in rose honey and afterwards I made larger and longer tents. And this continued, always enlarging the aforesaid tents until I had the width and depth of the wound as I wished. And then he says, when in my imagination I had reached the arrowhead, which I think is a lovely touch. It yes. shows how difficult it was in yes. the days before x-ray. Then, he says, I made uh, new tongs, small and concave, to the size of an arrow. I think of tongs like these. Yeah. Now, you see, to me, those are tongs. Yes, and I think what he's thinking, you see, is this is why I think he lays such stress on them being smooth. Because yes. you pass something like that down a wound, those two ends are going to jag in the flesh. You've got all this business around here of the screw. Obviously, he doesn't want to aggravate the wound as he passes these things down. I know. So they've got to be yes. very narrow, very smooth. Now, that is quite something. Yeah. That, in actual fact, he was thinking on his feet. He's he got the away, son of the king got, there with yes, an arrow in his head, and yes. he's got to think of something. He's got to think yes. of something. With Henry's life ebbing away, Bradmore was in a race against time to design and forge this revolutionary instrument. The smiths in the castle would have been absolutely fascinated because it's totally out of the run of the sort of thing that they would be doing. Chewing horses, making nails. Hector is using 15th century techniques to make something as close as possible to Bradmore's original invention. Back in 1403, Bradmore had no time to test it before inserting it into the skull of the prince. Any mistake now wouldn't only kill the future king, but would also be a catastrophe for the nation. Nick, your face! What? Get you a doctor now. I'd better go with him. It ain't no joke, I'd like to buy the world a token. Teach the world to sing it perfect. superpower for more than two centuries, exerting even more power than the US does today. A major new series takes a fresh look at the British Empire, how Britain made the modern world, Thursday at 9 on 4. 600 years ago, to save the life of Henry, Prince of Wales, a revolutionary instrument was forged to pull an arrow from his skull. Hector Cole and Tig Lang are about to test an exact replica. Here is the tool. Oh, that's wonderful. It just looks as if it's been picked off the page, doesn't it? Yes, yes. This is the piece that passed down through the that's wound, then right. smooth. As that turns, then this it opens, opens up out. So that it will open up onto the socket. The tip of the arrowhead is lodged in the bone. And of course, Bradmore's working blind, but he is passing this down through the path yes. of the wound. I can feel it entering the shaft, and I assume this is what he's doing. He's working by feel. He begins to turn the screw, and he would have felt the point at which this has gripped the arrowhead. I can feel there that it's firmer. Half their problem is to get the arrowhead out of the bone. The other half is that to all the time he's passing it up hole. through that wound, yes. it can't let go of this bodkin, Quite. or indeed to have it wobbling about.
I put the tongs inside the wound in the same manner that the arrow had first entered. Then I also put the screw in the middle, and at length the tongs entered the cavity of the arrowhead. And then moving it to and fro, little by little, I extracted the arrowhead. Various nobles and servants of the prince were standing by, and all gave thanks to God. As a skilled surgeon, Bradmore knew his job wasn't finished. Infection still had to be fought off. His antiseptic techniques were the result of centuries of medical observation. Medieval doctors were well aware that some natural products had a healing effect. The antiseptic Bradmore relied on most was honey. Its remarkable wound healing properties are only just beginning to be fully understood. And your little wound there, but we must we use the honey to heal that up. Okay. In a modern clinical trial, this patient's persistent leg ulcer has cleared up with the controlled use of medicinal honey. Honey's got a history going back 4,000 years for its medicinal properties, and I think there's an awful lot of interest in it. This is actually a leptospernum honey from Australia, and it's very useful as an antibacterial agent and also to stimulate wound healing. The other thing that's important about this honey is that it's sterile. It's been gamma irradiated, so that ensures that it is sterile and there are no spores in this honey. It contains many properties. It's got a very high osmolarity and therefore it will draw fluid out. And in doing this, it will draw out bacteria with it as well. It's got acidity, which inhibits bacteria, and some of the honeys produce this plant protein. The trial has discovered that these natural antibiotics, picked up by bees from plants, can actually help to heal human wounds. Thanks to Bradmore's surgical skill and clever use of antiseptics, Prince Henry lived to fight another day becoming one of England's most famous warrior kings, Henry V. Henry V is someone who leads from the front. He has a tremendous military experience and reputation behind him. He is forceful, I think domineering. I'm not sure we would like him if we, we met him. He forced other people, I think, into doing what he wanted. Henry led one of the most successful English campaigns in France, culminating in a famous victory at Agincourt in 1415. He put the lessons he learned at Shrewsbury to good use, taking 12 surgeons with him. But Henry wasn't to die from any wound inflicted by a battlefield weapon. Before he could secure his position in France, Henry was hit by a classic common soldier's complaint. Dysentery. Picked up from dirty water or food on campaign. Shigella, the dysentery bacteria, reduced Henry to an invalid, struggling.